198 new subscribers. That's how many the Marketplace of Ideas podcast needs this week alone to make the goal of 10,000 by the end of 2011 and thus survive, bringing you more cultural conversation of the depth you demand in 2012. Find out more about what the deal is with this and how you can help by going to ColinMarshallRadio.com. Click the Marketplace of Ideas logo, and there you'll find a very, very easy way to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list and learn more. That's ColinMarshallRadio.com and the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Thanks. Do we live in a world that has passively forgotten modernism, or do we live in a world that has actively rejected modernism? Oh, well, who knows? Uh, I suppose, as usual, the boring answer is it's a bit of both. I'm not sure that there is such a thing as actively remembering. Uh, It's either there at people's fingertips, and I think that there are still plenty of, well, not plenty, but there are certainly artists around who are very well aware of what modernism is was and is, because I think it's uh, one of the points I was trying to make is that it's actually important to see it not as something that is, you know, belongs to history, if we've finished 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever, but that it's something that is still with us, whether we are prepared to recognize it or not. It is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. I'm speaking to Gabriel Jasipovici, novelist, critic, and author of Whatever Happened to Modernism, a book that has caused quite a stir in some of the literary circles that I run in, especially over in the UK, but all over the internet as well. And I think it's important to think about why, because the question asked by the title is one I've asked many times myself to, to no real avail in my own inquiries, but much better information is available, of course, in this book. Now, the, the listener may wonder what, Gabriel, you, you consider to be modernism. And I, I have come to think of your conception of modernism, reading your books, this one and others, and previous critical essays as, mm. as being mm. the, the art of doubt and the art of uncertainty, the art of attempt rather than the art of presenting a success. Does that begin to get at it? Yes, that's certainly a, a, you know, a very essential component. So, you know, maybe the art of doubt suggests a little too much that it's, uh, it's something we can, as it were, control. Uh, it's certainly connected with doubt, uncertainty, exploration, and so on. Yeah. I, I quite agree. On the face of it, if you if you call modernism that, then that seems like it seems like it would be a tradition that that artists would only would only embrace as time goes by. That seems like were I a novelist, that's the that's the mode I would want to work in. But I, as somebody who enjoys reading modernist work. It, it does seem to me that the question, whatever happened to modernism, is is very valid because I'm not seeing a lot of what I would call modernist works in the English language today. So why why would a, I, I know you, you are a novelist and you do find this tradition appealing. Why would a novelist not find that appealing? <laughs> well, um certainly it all it's you know, the book is personal and all my you you mentioned there's other books, and they may look more, you know, a book on the Bible or a book on um, you know, trust or whatever, um, as if they are firmly and clearly out there. But they, and they all start from a personal problem and a personal question. And I suppose it goes back to, you know, my initial attempt to write, which hadn't really changed, and the feeling that uh, it's not something... You know, it's both something one terribly wants to do, at least that's what I felt when I was a struggling writer, and, you know, there didn't seem to be any way of doing it. At least whichever way of doing it I tried didn't sound right to my ears. 
Uh, now, of course, every adolescent goes through that sort of phase, and one works out of it if one sort of is, is driven in certain ways, I suppose. Um, but at that moment, I mean, I suppose, you know, 17, 18, I began to read a number of writers who struck me as so important to me because they themselves seemed to be experiencing the same thing. I felt that reading uh, Proust, where in the first volume in Combray, uh, Marcel is walking out one day uh, along the bank of the river and he is filled with joy at, at the day and he, he terribly wants to express this, but he just feels he can't and all he can do is reduce the bang his umbrella on the ground and saying, zoot, 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 zoot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I read Kafka, whose diaries were full of a sense that he just could not do what it was he wants to do, even though he didn't know what he wants to do. Uh, Eliot in um, The Wasteland, when I read uh, On Margaret Science, I Can Connect Nothing With Nothing, you know, The v Broken Fingernails of Dirty Hands, suddenly I felt a kind of warmth because, you know, here were obviously great writers and great works which seem to, who seem to be having the same sort of paradoxical experiences as as I was having, unlike, you know, the 19th century or the novel, or the, the, the kind of art that uh, I had until then, you know, or that I knew was supposed to be and was some of the great art of the past, but which seemed like a sort of huge mountain out there and that had nothing to do with me, whether it was Tolstoy or uh, uh, George Eliot or, or whatever, even Shakespeare, they were just themselves, and they didn't speak in that particular way, where suddenly here were people who were, my goodness, you know, they were like me. And and this sense of uh, uh, finding, you know, maybe what I later began to think of as a tradition of those without a tradition, uh, you know, was enormously important. And in a way, I then spent my, my critical life uh, wanting to explore and explain um, those particular writers and others like them who I felt to be sort of kindred spirits. They could go back to uh, Tristram Shandy or to, even to Rabelais, uh, but they seemed to me to have this same sense that there was something inherently ridiculous and absurd about the whole writing enterprise, and yet that somehow, some way must be found to, to do it. And, um, you know, when you, your, your question was, uh, you know, why wouldn't one uh, feel that? My sense was indeed a kind of amazement that the novels, particularly the novels, but I think you know, other forms of art that I was told uh, was, you know, contemporary art of great importance, seemed to me to have none of that sort of hesitation, exploration, the feeling that if you wanted to get where you had to get, you had to go by a very indirect route. What, what so fascinates you about that, that point where words fail, where something can't be brought fully into prose from, from its original position in the world? Ah, well, again, I suppose as I was writing this particular book, I began to feel that this was a sort of double thing. There was a sort of paradox here. On the one hand, you had, let us stay with, with Kafka or Eliot, saying that they were impotent, that they didn't know how to move forward, and so on and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, that very saying few lines, like on Margaret Sands, you know, I can connect nothing with nothing, the broken fingernails of that hand, was so much more immediate and so much more exciting as art, well, as anything, was just so much more immediate and exciting than a writing which uh, simply went into its own way, told a particular story, wrote a poem about a particular episode, uh, that seemed to be fine in itself, but didn't seem to start from within me. 
so that there's this paradoxical thing that on the one hand it was a sort of gesture of failure, and yet it was also a kind of assertion of what it might be to what it might need to get an art that was much more immediate, much more direct, much more visceral. And of course, I I realized that I was finding that sort of thing in 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 the art of the past, in the kind of density of Hopkins lines, which had always thrilled me. Um, again, he was struggling to articulate these things, and the very struggle gave his verse a sort of intensity and, and density and made me want to go back and reread it and gave me pleasure in a way that his contemporaries at Tennyson or uh, Swinburne, however beautiful their work, obviously didn't. What, what drove you to want to explore this from both the side of the novelist, of the artist, and the side of the critic, of, of the scholar? These are, these are things that people often think they, think they somehow need to keep separate for whatever reasons they come up with on their own, but you've balanced them. What, what has motivated you to lead the, the parallel careers, or do you consider them to be parallel exactly? I don't consider teaching and writing to be parallel. I earn my living as a university teacher because I realized early on that the kind of writing I was doing was not going to earn me much of a living or might not, and I really didn't want to compromise on that score, and I preferred to do something that would be interesting and fun and and useful. And I didn't feel that there was much in common. I thought I could have been a milkman or whatever, and, you know, the two things would have been separate. But that is different from uh, writing fiction or plays. I've written both. I don't write poetry. I don't know how it's done. But uh, writing fiction or plays and writing criticism. Because as I said to you at the beginning, um, each of the critical books that I've written and each of the critical essays have sprung out of a need to explain to myself why these people move me. And that isn't, you know, a hundred miles away from writing a novel, which is a way of trying to explain to yourself why something in the world moves you. Uh, You just want to somehow uh, master, get get hold of something which, which gnaws away at you if it, if it, hasn't been put into words, or at least not the way at that kind of word that says people like me. Is there is there a sense in which you believe that if you get down far enough to the essence of what moves you, of what you enjoy, if you get far down enough into that, if you understand what moves you well enough, if you can sort of convey convey that well enough to an audience, you do you do make it relatable and make it enjoyable even to an audience that would have been dubious about, say, modernism or any other tradition you happen to be moved by yourself? Well, of course, one writes for the clarified for oneself and for the few people one wants to talk to who are specific sort of individuals. But of course, one hopes that you know, a larger group of people will will appreciate this. And just to talk about the criticism, uh, of course I thought that by explaining, clarifying, uh, making people, as I thought, understand what a writer like Kafka or Proust or a later writer like Perec or Thomas Bernhardt uh, was up to would enable them to appreciate not just those authors, but uh, maybe other authors of a similar kind, let's say modernist authors. Um, and of course, I was disappointed. Um, my, my criticism has been received until this new book with, you know, uh, approval, let's say. Um, but it hasn't made one blinding bit of difference. And in the world at large, the world of, at least that I inhabit the English sort of literary scene, uh, not that I inhabit, but that I'm familiar with, um, things seem to have gone 
downhill rather than uphill, you know, so that one starts off idealistically thinking, oh, well, soon as I explain these things, everyone will, will nod and start to see the light. Whereas, of course, uh, even though, you know, a few people said, oh, wonderful, and I do understand this more fully now, and so on, uh, by and large, what I was seeing was a, a culture at large really changing from one in which there was a pocket, a, a small but, but you know, still reasonable pocket of people who were like-minded uh, with whom I felt I could talk about such things, to so there being very, very, very few and the sense that the, the culture in general had, in a way, forgotten or lost track of uh, the things that were most interesting. So, of course, this was, uh, I suppose, the kind of um, lesson in, in hard reality that, you know, most people experience in the course of their <laughs> lives, but it's never a pleasant experience. This book, Whatever Happened to Modernism, seems to me to be the, lo- the logical continuation of much of what you've written in critical essays before. So why was this book the one to reach so much farther outside your existing readership? All these things are, at least in, in my case, just kind of happen. I was working on a novel. I was asked to give a a lecture in London, and I had been feeling more and more marginalized in the uh, in English culture in ways I was describing a moment ago. And I thought, okay, I'm giving a lecture at um, in London at a fairly uh, high-profile sort of venue, uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of London. Uh, let me take one more look back at, as you say, things that I've always talked about, but try and sort of give one final sort of summing up and maybe even take the opportunity uh, not to pull any punches about the things I don't like as well as the things I do like. That maybe in order to explain more fully why those things I like, I like, I have to say what I have always avoided, tact and politeness and so on. Uh, doing, which is uh, saying, you know, it's never seemed to me particularly valuable to write reviews, say, of things I don't like. But here I decided, okay, I do that. And um, I did it, and it provoked quite a lot of argument uh, from the floor and no little antagonism, which slightly surprised me because, of course, one always thinks that one will have an audience on one's own side. I didn't think much more about it. And then, as I went on trying to write that novel, uh, and it went on not being able to get written, and I was casting around for ways to somehow move away from it, uh, keep it in mind, but actually shift to something else which was sort of doable, because I was getting frustrated with not getting anywhere. Um, I suddenly thought, well, actually, there are quite a few things in that essay that could be expanded, and so I expanded it. But basically, the book was meant to be just filling a gap until I could get around to writing this novel. Fortunately, it did the trick, and once the book was done, I had been able to get on and had just finished this novel. So, you know, from that point of view, it was purely something that was there in the kind of big parenthesis. As to why it is that what you asked? Why it reached a larger audience? Right. Yes. Why did it? How did it reach far beyond your existing readership? Given that it seems to me like it's just the logical next step in the critical subjects you've been discussing. I don't understand these things, and I, I don't know how much larger a readership it has reached. It certainly has a bit of notoriety because an absurd journalist uh, got hold of the. Uh, one chapter which was critical and picked out four sentences that uh, were very critical of my contemporaries, thought there was a good story there, and uh, got on the phone to me, uh, having got the permission of Yale. I tried to set her right and explain to her that actually this, as you were saying, was 
part of a larger argument that it, I didn't want it to descend to a question of personalities. Uh, I wasn't interested in personalities. The book was against personalities. But I was trying to deal with a complicated and difficult subject which couldn't be reduced to uh, Yabu sort of uh, criticism. She took all that down, and we had three phone calls, and she then published this ridiculous thing in, in The Guardian, which caused quite a stir, uh, which was just sort of more or less a you know, professor slags off writers. <laughs> uh, got the facts wrong, got me wrong, uh, got what I was saying wrong. On the back of that, all the papers and all the radio and television stations started ringing me up and asking me if I would elaborate on what I had said. When I said I'm not really interested in that, in that it's not what I said, but I'd be very happy to elaborate on the book, they all said, well, thank you, but no, thank you. So, you know, that is that. And uh, if that helped the book to get a larger sale, well, I suppose in the long run, you know, one forgets that. But it was very unpleasant. And I was sorry it happened. Tell me about England. In the, in, I mean, England today and the English, the English readership today. Is, is England less receptive to modernism than the rest of Europe, than the rest of the world? Or is it simply, is it simply where you are and thus where you get, where you get more of a read on as far as their, um, as far as their perhaps negative attitude toward modernism yeah. today? Well, I mean, it's it's difficult to say, of course, but I mean, some of my novels have been uh, translated into uh, French and German and Italian, and uh, particularly in Germany, uh, I feel that when I go and do readings there, uh, there's a an audience that is lively, interested, and operating at an intellectual level far superior to that. In England, I mean, I'll give you, uh, I think, maybe a a better example. I had a novel published in the 90s and went to Broadcasting House uh, at the World Service to do uh, two interviews, one with uh, English, some sort of literary magazine um, in English, and then with the French equivalent. And the first question that the English chap asks me is, why do you write such difficult stories? Oh, it is a volume of stories. Why do you write such difficult stories? <laughs> Don't you want readers to read them? The first question that the Frenchman asked was, that, well, I thought this was a very interesting story. Which was your favorite? That seemed to me to sort of sum up the, the, the different attitudes. And this is what I felt in England all the time, that somehow if one does anything that is slightly different from the norm, somehow one is expected to, to justify it. And it seems like, you know, an, an affront. Uh, whereas um, in France, uh, certainly in Germany, there is the sense that you are working within a certain tradition, which, um, you know, the people who've come to hear you or the people who are going to ask you questions or review your book are, you know, perfectly aware of. I compare it to, I'm very interested in, in uh, new music and I've had fr- composer friends uh, all my life. Uh, I go to new music concerts and of course, composers, they are always complaining they have such a tiny, tiny audience. But at least it's a literate audience which has a, an awareness of the tradition in which they're working. They you know, they know their, their Schoenberg and their Weber and their Stravinsky and their Stockhaus. And uh, they, you know, come with, uh, you know, a reasonably uh, educated mind. Whereas, in a sense, the idea is that, oh, well, if the man on the Clapham omnibus can't understand it, there must be something wrong with it, uh, as far as the literary side of it is concerned. So I do think that English literary culture lags, you know, is enormously more closed than musical or artistic culture. In whatever happened to modernism, I mean, I get the feeling of, 
I get the feeling of modernism as a vehicle of sort of artistic exhilaration, you know. Mm, difficulty, mm, mm. difficulty is not a word I think about. It's a word that you've brought up with that interviewer saying. Yes. And, it's, and I suppose there is a sense in which modernist, say, literature is difficult. But to, to my mind, a modernist book, a modernist novel, you read it, and even if you don't necessarily grasp the entire tradition from which it came, if you don't, if you don't grasp the, all the references that it might make to things in the world, there's still a, a formal exhilaration to it. Do you understand what I mean by that? So I couldn't agree more. I mean, absolutely. I mean, two, two things, maybe. Uh, one is, you know, the, the notion that there are you know, there are page turners and then there are serious, dull, but worthy books, I think is, is, is a load of nonsense. I find myself far keener to turn the pages of Kafka than I am of Iris Murdoch or, or whoever the, you know, Martin Amis, whatever. It keeps me going because it's exhilarating. No, I quite agree. I don't think that, that difficulty is, is an issue at all. And I think probably the, when I said that about the, 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 the music, uh, Again, that's maybe slightly misleading. I, I quite agree. I think one can read works and set. I've tried to suggest that a, work, an, a writer like Aaron Applefeld or Muriel Spark, who is you know widely read uh, within a certain uh, sort of readership, but you know certainly reaches out to a wide, wide public, uh, to me uh, has many of the elements of uh, um, or Kafka or Borges or whatever. So I don't feel that. You know, formal experimentation or complexity uh, or anything is necessary. You know, it's not a necessary condition. In some cases, one will find that writers um, enjoy that and do it well, and it's it's part and parcel of what the experience is. But others have a an extraordinary directness and, and simplicity. And I think William Goldie. I mean, I tried again in in whatever happened to modernism deliberately to mingle. Writers like Muriel Spark and William Golding, who are recognized at least by the English establishment, to, to, to put these in the same bracket as a Rob Grier or a, a Claude Simon, Marguerite Duras, who are always seen as somehow different. I don't think they are different. Uh, I think the differences lie uh, elsewhere between those people who have sort of understood instinctively the sort of thing we were talking about early on and those who kind of go blindly on their way as if none of those problems existed. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is Gabriel Jossipavici, critic, novelist, author of many books, but most recently one that's made a big splash in the media called Whatever Happened to Modernism. And it's a question, as a fan of modernism, I've had many times myself. When this conversation is over, if you want to hear it again, check it out on the podcast version if you're not doing so already at colinmarshallradio.com. That's colinmarshallradio.com. Or you could get it on the iTunes store. Just pull up iTunes, search for the Marketplace of Ideas, and pull it up in their podcast directory. Either way, on colinmarshallradio.com or on the iTunes store, it's all completely free for the download. Get weekly updates on current and upcoming Marketplace of Ideas interviews as well as a lot of related internet interestingness on the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list, of course, completely free. You can sign up very easily on colinmarshallradio.com. It's on the front page of the Marketplace of Ideas official website. You get there by clicking on the Marketplace of Ideas logo. It's all explained, takes two seconds, and then you're tapped in to all things Marketplace of Ideas. Now, back to the conversation with Gabriel Jossipavici on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. There's, there's something you, you've written about elsewhere that I, that I very much enjoyed reading about, which is you, it's, it's your remembrance of writing your first novel and how you, you repeatedly became stuck describing a character, I believe, walking into a house and not being yeah. sure how much of the house to describe upon the character's entrance and then realizing you could apply a rule that said that you were not going to use description, that you were going to use dialogue and you were going to use lists. And you, you thus had rules to work within that, that activated uh, you, you as an artist. And I think of modernism as that. I think of modernism as a means for artists to, shall we say, activate themselves. Do you think that holds in a broader sense than that specific instance of your own writing? 
Oh, absolutely. No, no, I think that's absolutely right. And and what you say there is, is in a way, uh, uh, you know, he's picking up on, on what I was saying to you earlier on, but it, it, my interest in these people stems from my feeling that they were encountering the same problems as I had. And, and, and this was exactly my uh, that problem, as you say, with my first novel, The Inventory. How does one... Uh, I knew I could see the house, but this... Uh, the listener who is going to take the inventory of a dead person or help the family do it. I could see the house he was arriving at. And it had never struck me that this was going to be a problem, but I didn't know how to describe it. I thought, do I describe it in a paragraph, in two paragraphs, in, in a page, uh, in a sentence? What sort of tone do I use? And I realized that every tone I used was the tone of some other writer. And somehow I didn't want that. And um, I suddenly realized I didn't want an a narrating voice at all, but what interested me was these people talking uh, because there was something much more open about it. I wasn't directing the reader into what they were feeling and so on, but letting the reader discover that through their, their exchanges. Um, and that sort of breakthrough, I'm sure, is um, uh, replicated uh, you know, in grander ways by greater writers, whether it's, it's uh, Kafka suddenly, you know, over in one night, uh, sort of finding his rules and so on when writing uh, the judgment, uh, which he felt was a kind of breakthrough uh, work, or uh, who started 10 years of uh, meandering and wandering since he'd given up his, his unfinished novel, uh, Jean Santé, trying to write criticism, trying to write. Uh, and so on, uh, suddenly finding the way to, to do it. But I think every every artist, and I'm sure this holds true for non-modernist artists, uh, there's a point at which you sort of suddenly discover what it is that can make you move forward. And suddenly you feel, yes, this is good. Of course, that doesn't hold as, as I... I'm sure that my experience, say, with this last novel where I just couldn't go forward is, is replicated in many instances. One knows of many examples in all the arts of, of blocks of one kind or another. But certainly, I think, has to be a moment early on where, where you do have that kind of eureka moment. And it seems to me, in the instance of the inventory, that the rules you, you decided to work under, they also added... They added a humor to the book. They, you know, I know, I know, lightness is lightness is very important to you. I know. Is did, did do these rules grant a certain lightness? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, that uh, I mean, in a sense, uh, where where does it come from? That um, Raymond Queneau writes in a certain way, or Thomas Bernhardt writes in a certain way. It's a bodily thing, and and uh, and who knows where it comes from? But. Uh, Certainly, lightness is something I've treasured in the art of uh, of others, uh, so that I'm much fonder of uh, Stravinsky than I am of Schoenberg. I'm uh, much fonder of uh, Kurtag than I am of Stockhausen. I'm much fonder of uh, Renaud than uh, you know I am of Sartre, and so on. I I, I treasure it. I think that uh, that humour is is just something that extraordinary and wonderful and has to be preserved. And, and if I, if my books can be... I realized when I was writing that inventory that uh, a book that hadn't really made much impression on me was there at the back of my mind, and that was Cunot's Zazie dans le Métro. Uh, as I was writing, I suddenly began to think, oh, my goodness, I can be sort of realistic in the sense of staying within, but I can also start getting a bit crazy. Um, and... You know, Cuno helped me to see that that was possible. And then I lost interest in Cuno and hadn't read him for years and years. I've been rereading him now and finding him wonderful and wondering why I ignored him all this time. So, yes, lightness with uh, all these things are, are very important. I love Muriel Spark for, for that reason. She writes short novels that are utterly readable. You pick them up, you can't put them down, you read them in one evening. And you want to go back to them again and again. And to me, that's the kind of wonderful model. 
Now, this is not something you write specifically about, that you directly address in Whatever Happened to Modernism, I believe, but in previous writings, of course, you have talked about your idea of art as toy, and that's a concept that I couldn't stop thinking about while I was reading Whatever Happened to Modernism. Does, does, that, does that underlie this book at all, though it's not mentioned in the book? Well, on the cover, uh, and I don't think the cover quite worked for some reason, but I wanted very much to have an image by Paul Clay, because Clay, again, is one of these artists who seem to me to be completely modern, but witty, light, and humorous. And uh, I wanted, because it was called, um, the actual title he gave to this painting, uh, is The Ghost of a Genius. That seemed to sum up so well what uh, uh, I wanted to catch in the book, which is that you know, modernism, the notion of, of genius, can only, as it were, survive in a ghostly way, and only humorously, perhaps. But there is still that romantic striving, but without any of the romantic belief that this can um, somehow uh, transcend the world, an acceptance of the world, an acceptance of uh, uh, roughness, of uh, things getting lost at the edges and so on, all that is part and parcel of it. But I thought that was captured in, in that image. So even if the book itself doesn't maybe talk about it very much, uh, though I do have a chapter on clowns, I hope that the cover would kind of alert people to that. Nobody's mentioned it, so probably it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you, you picked it up. <laughs> and for those who don't know, for those listening who aren't aware, I mean, they might hear me talk about your ideas of, of art as toy, and they might think, well, here's a man who's dedicated his life to this kind of art, and yet he calls it a toy. Uh, how can how can you say that? But toy, you have a specific meaning, and it makes sense. I mean, how do you conceive of toy as you apply it to art? The Elizabethan uh, notion of toy was like uh, was linked to, to, to our notion of uh, you know toying with somebody, uh, playing with them, as well as what a child has. And um, for some reason, I felt I warmed towards artists like Clay or critics like Walter Benjamin, who talked about children's toys, uh, who uh, were aware of their kind of excitement. But I think my sense that uh, these are things which are not uh, naturalistic, a child's uh, hobby horse can be just uh, the most basic uh, uh, simulacrum of a horse, but which the imagination can then allow to work. And somehow I felt, yes, this brings together a number of these things that we have already talked about, the fact that um, that art is something to be made, uh, it's a made object, uh, it's something that uh, has got to sort of work once it's made, but it can be made with any sort of rough materials, with uh, detritus, with uh, odd bits of uh, found objects, uh, and uh, pieced together in a rough and ready way, if it catches that spirit of uh, something that is good to play with. And I feel that in one's relation to, to art, that one ought to be a little less focused about it, and a little more uh, ready to see uh, humor. But, you know, the bad side of romances was this extreme, that these are terribly profound and important things. Well, they're profound and important, but, you know, maybe one way to to get them across is, and not just to get them across, that sounds condescending, but children's stories are also you know, terribly important. A story that gets lost or, or disappears, you know, leaves the child in tears. And I felt that this was also something that I could do, because somehow if it's manageable in this way, it's just an object, a simple little object out there, uh, that makes it much more possible than thinking of it as, you know, a masterpiece that has to be written or whatever. Uh, that's all too grandiose. I'm, I'm much happier uh, thinking about it as, 
you know, a little thing which ideally will have some life in it. This example of a toy, a hobby horse that you bring up, of course, these are very simple, essentially, the, the, the shape of a horse head on a stick. And if they were if they were more complex, if they were more detailed, if they were more like a horse, it wouldn't work as well as a toy because the child playing with it couldn't use their imagination. Exactly. And exactly. I, I want to I wanna ask if when you're, when you're writing a novel or when you're reading a novel, I mean, either way, is it, are you always on the lookout for giving the reader too much so that they can't engage, so that they can't participate? I mean, do you write something and say, oh, I've, I've given the reader a little too much and they won't be able to participate and have to pare it down? Or do you read books where you say, oh, this is, this is given too much, I, I can't participate, and thus I'm not excited? Well, certainly with the reading, I feel um, that's why I can't really read 19th century novels, because I feel I don't want all this stuff that I'm pushing into my head. Uh, I don't want all these stories, all these descriptions, all these uh, alien narratives. Uh, I'd like something which... Uh, is much more suggestive and much more fluid and which opens things up. So that's as far as the reading is concerned. I think with the writing, it's a little bit different. Uh, I'm, in a way, it's ridiculous I'm involved with it because I suppose I'm just, you know, I'm not very competent at it. I just want to keep going till, till I get to the end and, and hope that, you know, I've been able to make something. So that each making of any one thing is, is a hard enough task for me not to worry too much about is it giving too much and giving too little. Maybe looking back at it, um, you know, one feels, you know, I've been able to, to do with very little, that's great. But sometimes also, um, you know, I've been happy that the texture's been a bit richer and my books have varied between books that are in, in sort of dialogue mainly and books that are more in a kind of continuous, sort of, not exactly a monologue, but but more like a, a stream, more closer to to more Thomas Bernhardt, um, and and I quite like this moving from the one to the other, or possibly even combining the two if one can. How close can you get to approaching your own novels as? A critic, as someone separate from those novels, of course, you can never not be the author of one of your novels. But how 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 much of an outside view can you eventually attain of your novels? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think one can. Um, I've um, I recently had a novel <clears throat> that I wrote in the nineties, come out in Germany, it's coming out in in, in France uh, in April, and I'm going over to France, and I feel I ought to. Reread it. It's very, very difficult. Uh, I sit down and it just looks terrible. I, I can't bear it. I just feel, you know, I don't want to know about this. I think once it's done, it's a very strange thing that, you know, it's completely obsessive why one's doing it, and then once it's done, you in a way don't want to know about it anymore. I think that I can feel as I'm working. Yes, this is good. This is uh, doing what I'm. After this is um, opening up areas which I hadn't quite been able to open up before, or this is just getting by, and you know, I'd be glad when I get to the end of it. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't let the novel go, obviously, if I didn't believe in it. But I suppose I believe in some more than in others. But that's about as near as I can get, you know, to, to being critical. I'm sure as one is writing, one is both critic and and writer. One is one's ears are alive to what what is working and what isn't and what is false and what isn't. And that's why when too much seems false and you can't see how to you know, move to something more authentic, that's when you know you can't move forward. I think about that novel you mentioned being translated into German, new, newly translated and you know, I think about pe- people writing about your work. They they don't they never refer to you as being from any one place because I suppose they could name multiple places. And mm. they, of course, you you read multiple languages and your books get translated into other languages. And you you, you quote work in the original in whatever happened to modernism. What what does this internationalism 
give you in, in terms of any of the work you do, this, this ability to, to move from cultural context to cultural context, what, uh, what do you draw from that? Well, of course, when I began again to, to go back to those, uh, that year I had between school and university when I was trying to write and not finding my way and starting to read uh, Proust and so on, I cursed my past because here I was, I felt I'm not inward with any language. I was born in France in, in the war. Uh, we were Jews. We were sort of not quite in hiding, but certainly more or less in hiding. Uh, I went with my mother to Egypt where she'd been born, spent 10 years there, but felt, you know, I didn't feel at one with the culture, but anyway, I didn't know the language of, of the bulk of the population. Uh, so one was always a bit of an outsider. I came to England at 15. I didn't feel inward either with the culture or with the language. So, of course, at first I felt this is terrible. How have I been somehow shortchanged by history in this way? And then, you know, slowly I suppose one gets to work out the advantages of one's disadvantage. And I have metaphorically written up over my desk a wonderful remark of, of Stravinsky, as I've, I've mentioned before you. I'm sorry to repeat it, but it is a great thing where he says, um, had Beethoven had Mozart's lyric gift, he would never have developed his rhythmic capacities. And I think that's terrific because what it's saying is, uh, you know, it's not just that we must make do with the little that we have, but somehow that's because other people don't have that little. Uh, they haven't seen what the potential is in that little. So I suppose I, you know, I still feel a lack in not being inward with English culture and with the English language, and I envy people like Muriel Spark or Proust who are, you know, deeply at home in in a whole in all the varieties of of the language they're working in. But one then finds areas where one can operate, which maybe this whole thing of wanting the work to be like a toy and so on is because, you know, one can make a toy out of anything. And if all I have is, is little bits and, and, and pieces of, of, the, of the language, well, you know, I'll make it out of that and see what happens. So, um, you know, as far as the writing's concerned, I don't feel it as a, you know, a great positive. I have over the years, I taught at uh, University of Sussex in the School of European Studies, and I felt very strongly that uh, no writer before 1800 certainly ever thought of himself or herself as being an English writer or a French writer or an Italian writer. They were European. They were uh, uh, writers who felt that you know, Homer or Virgil or Dante or Spencer or whoever it was were as much part of that patrimony as, as you know, anyone else. And that this is certainly what one should have. And I suppose that, again, having lived in, in a variety of places and had this rather unusual background, uh, I'm more open to uh, uh, writing or uh, uh, whatever it might be uh, than you know people who have been brought up within a more conventional in a more conventional way and perhaps not really crossed too many borders. And having crossed many borders must be, it must be an advantage for criticism. I mean, it give, the, having a larger perspective can only be a positive in criticism, can it not? Well, I think it's a positive and I think it's a positive in, in criticism and I, I, I feel strongly that it must be a positive in, in life and that it's important that certainly in in uh, Europe today, that uh, that you know, however awful aspects of the European Union are, that it's a terribly important thing that Europe is a whole. But that doesn't mean that all the different parts of it aren't, you know, fascinatingly different. But that you know, people should be uh, at ease. There. And it's wonderful when I see younger people traveling the world. For them now, you know, going to Southeast Asia or India or Alaska or whatever is is as normal as it was for me to just, you know, 
go to Paris or, or Berlin. And I think that that can only be good for, for humanity. Uh, and naturally, it's good for criticism. And speaking of criticism, there, there's one lesson that I seem to draw from whatever happened to modernism. And it's the suggestion that critics maybe haven't done as much of a job as they could have in in fostering or or f- fostering more interesting work and uh taking their attention away from less interesting work is is that at all something you were thinking about when writing That's a very very good question and uh I certainly had very much in mind the fact that again to come back to, to something we sort of touched on earlier when I came to England in uh, the late 50s, I was reading uh, Philip Toynbee in The Observer, and I was reading uh, John Berger in The New Statesman, and uh, uh, Wilfred Miller, the music critic uh, uh, in The Spectator, and so on. And these were people with, you know, wide, wide perspective. And... Uh, Again, a multinational uh, awareness of of the past, and they their criticism was imbued with this, so that when uh, when they talked uh, even negatively about uh, the art or the music or the literature of the present, uh, it was because they had standards derived from you know a long uh, immersion in and. In, 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 in the culture and, and, and the belief that there were important things. And so when they praised, they praised with a kind of uh, passion because, you know, that, that, that grew out of their interest in their, their wide and deep vision. And i and this seems to me to be what, certainly what weekly and daily critics and, of course, you know, university critics and so on ought to be doing as well, but especially weekly and daily critics. Uh, or to bring to the public a sense that uh, they have got this perspective which they are helping the public to acquire. And as you say, one finds very little of that, certainly in the literary culture. Um, I think both in America and in, in England, there is a sense that, uh, you know, of something very, very, very limited, and I don't feel the critics are really doing their, their job. I'm probably unfair. I said you don't read them all, <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are, there are notable exceptions. That's the kind of uh, general feeling that I get. And this is true, I think, even of music and art criticism, although, as I say, I think that music in, in England is thriving, and certainly there's a huge variety in art. But you don't get this feeling that you trust the the critics as, as much as I felt then. Although that may be that, you know, when I came, I was, you know, I was an adolescent and now uh, I'm more critical because I look back from, you know, a longer perspective. And finally, there's this, this brings me to a contradiction of modernism that I see that that I want to return to, because of course, someone with your own background or the background of, of a, of a very, of a, critics broad view and long history can find so much in modernist works can understand so much about them and can appreciate so much about you know where they're placed in literary history and what they're doing with the the setting that these works find themselves in but at the same time so much of what I what I enjoy about modernism is right there on the surface is the is the feeling of an author or any any type of creator essentially implicitly saying to the reader or the audience I'm trying somewhere new I'm I'm going to terra incognita and I'm not going to pretend like I have already mapped this territory you're going to know this is new to me and to you but the sheer excitement of going there you know that's that comes through in the form on the surface and it seems like that's that's as much appreciate there's as much appreciation to have for that as there is for all the shall we say references uh in any sense of that word you can get if you know all about modernism does that make sense oh absolutely absolutely and one can just sort of feel this as you say you don't have to know anything to, uh instinctively but there is uh 
something is happening here, that you know, somebody taking risks and uh, finding their way towards something different and, and interesting. It may be fairly narrow, fairly small, but you know, it's always worthwhile and, and far more uh, worthwhile than you know, just the repetition and, and to, uh, of, of you know, long except you know, the doing well of something which lots of other people have done well as well. Uh, one thing that does hearten me is uh, reading again uh, things that one finds sort of on on blogs and, and, and things like that is that young younger readers uh, who seem to uh, write in these uh, things or respond to essays uh, on the internet and so on are maybe not uh, as well read uh, or sometimes not well read at all, uh, but are less closed, are much more ready to recognize that kind of exploratory thing than you know, their more respected peers who are writing in the, in the print media or talking on, on radio and television who uh, are very set in their way, set in this country. I've been speaking with Gabriel Josipovici, author of Whatever Happened to Modernism. Gabriel, thanks so much for taking the time this morning. Well, thank you. Uh, really, really interesting. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to find out more about Gabriel Josipovici and whatever happened to modernism, visit his website at gabrieljosipovici.org. That is Gabriel, J-O-S-I-P-O-V-I-C-I, dot org. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear this conversation again or any other interview in the program's history at colinmarshallradio.com or on the iTunes store. Just search for the Marketplace of Ideas. And there as well, the complete interview archive, all, of course, completely free. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is at benalthaus.com. And if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or whatever, email me at colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. It's colin at colinmarshallradio.com. And if you'd like to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list, don't hesitate because it is a weekly delivery of all kinds of info on current and upcoming Marketplace of Ideas interviews as well as related internet interestingness. You can sign up at callonmarshallradio.com there on the Marketplace of Ideas page. All the instructions, and they're very easy, are right there at the top. As always, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand.